actually, we're just gonna go over the other mic, maybe. See what we got. All right, Let's give it one more chance. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thanks Benjamin and, and Amanda for leading us, and for Levi and Matt and Sarah in the back, and uh, for Kara and Chad and Beckett up here. Beckett, it's it's good to have the bass again. Where did Beckett go? I don't know. He's somewhere, somewhere around here. Uh, as one who has spent more of my Sunday mornings up playing music uh, than I have preaching, it's nice to uh, to have the bass back in again. Oh, would you like to go? Would you like to leave? Okay. All right. Well, kids, if you want to go that way, feel free to follow Elsie and Willa and Ben and Truett and Solomon and uh, Henry and Remy and, uh, let's see, I think we see, yeah, there's Mr. Theodore. We got um, Margo and, yeah. See you, buddy. Um, Lord, we thank you for all the rest of the kids whose heads I still don't recognize from the back. Um, and we pray, Lord, that we would continue to be a church that um, that is a place for all the, the very young to the very old to come and to know you, uh, and that we would be able to learn from and be encouraged uh, by the presence of one another. Uh, amen. Okay, so a little bit of what we're doing, and just as a way of refresher, so uh, we, we're taking a break from our time in Luke, and we're looking at some specific practices uh, that we see the, the disciples participating in, in the book of Acts, uh, and so all kind of truncated by and, and, and set in place by Acts 1. So why did Julie read Acts 1 and then some of Acts 13? Well, actually, a lot of Acts 13. Uh, well, one, we want to remember, and one of the things that, we, that all believers, that all disciples have in common uh, that we need to be locked in on is that Jesus is Lord. We talked about this last week, right? Like, so um, <clears throat> the, you know, he's, he's picked up the tab. The, the scoreboard is turned off, okay? And so, so from that, uh, that, that the, the fact that, that we've been forgiven, that we walk in, in wholeness of life through him and by him and, and in him, then as a result of that, then we go and we participate in some specific practices. Now, the list that we're going through in Acts isn't an exhaustive list. Okay? It's just some ones that as we look through, a few of us uh, that we're going over, we say, hey, these are, are some that I think that we as people at Communitas uh, in 2024 need to be paying attention to and participating in and thinking about. So the first one I want to talk about is that of Sabbath. So uh, when I was, uh, let's see, yeah, I was, I was about 23. I was working at this ranch. I remember I was, I was filling out my, 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 uh, my time card, and I mean, it's just been an exhausting week, right? Like, I got my usual uh, tasks and things like that, and some of what I did is I, um, we would, we kind of fix things, and, and then I also brought people to the airport. I'd bring people to town if they needed to, and we were about an hour and a half from cell phone service, and it was about two hours uh, until you got to the closest town, uh, they need kind of decent size, and so one day I'd come back, and, and, and I, I'd just gotten back from, from a late night airport run, and I get a message from our secretary, and she's like, hey, uh, the heat in this particular cabin is not working right now, I need you to go over and do that, so I go over and I take care of the zone valve, and uh, replace that out, swap it out, get back to my, my, my bunk, and it's like, I'd already been up since like five that morning, and it was way past five in the evening, and I was like, man, I'm really ready to just go to bed, um, and then I get this, another call, they're like, hey, I know that everybody else is sleeping, we assume that you're going to be up, and uh, this guy, Ron, you know Ron, well, R Ron thinks his appendix is bursting, so we need you to, like, bring him to the hospital, and I was like, okay, so I get in, and I bring him down, and I, so I drive, like, an hour and 15 minutes to close hospital, drive him up, but they didn't think his appendix burst, obviously, we called the ambulance, or, like, flown something up, but he's like, yeah, hey, Ron's really sick, you got to bring him in, so I bring him in, and I get back, and it's like, past midnight and I'm like I am just pooped out and I remember I was, I was telling up my my score my um my, my scorecard. Yeah, some of us look, view our time cards, our scorecard, but we'll get to that. And so uh, I'm, I'm filling up my, my card and, I, was, and I, I got to the end. I was like, oh, 66 hours. And I was like, oh, is this is what it's like to work a, a 60 hour week. And there was this, this thing in me because of how I'd been raised that, you know, you're supposed to have a full calendar and be busy and all these things. There was this part of me that I was like, oh, cool. Like I did that. There was like a sense of arrival. Like, yeah, check it out. I just worked a 60 hour week. And there was another part of me that was like, I'm exhausted. And not just physically, but like, I just found myself going up and, and I was, I was a crew leader. And so some of the problems that I had to solve took longer that week. And, and it was just like, man, this is not 
awesome because in addition to the 60 hours or you know the 66 hours or whatever it was that I got paid that week, there were also some of my other obligations to being part of the various services that we did, uh, participating in, in dinners with the guests and uh, just kind of being on staff devotionals, Bible study, these sorts of things. And, uh, and I was just pooped out. And one of the things they taught us, and they, they told us it was because we got one day off a week. They said, we're going to be 24 hours where you have no obligations to the ranch. You can go to town. You can do whatever you need to do. Um, and they'd always tell us at the beginning of the year, like, don't go all out on that day off. Like, make sure you have some time, like, sleep in or, or go to bed early or do whatever else. Now, did I ever listen to that? No, because I was in Colorado. I was in the middle of the mountains. Some of my best friends lived there. And so I'd like drive to town. We'd go, we'd get burgers. We'd hang out. We'd play pool. We'd do whatever else. And I would get up early and I'd leave or I'd leave like right after my shift was done. And I'd head into town and like hang out to this Bible study and, and stay up late and do whatever else. And then I'd come back super late. And then, you know, you're sitting there going, oh my gosh, in like four hours, I got to be pushing horses in. And then you, you come back after, like ever had one of these kind of vacations where you come back from your vacation, you need a vacation because you're just pooped out. Okay, now flip that. Now fast forward. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I wasn't working at the ranch anymore, and I was um, I was working for a company that we installed and maintained solar powered water circulation machines. So if you ever told me heard me tell stories about my time paddling boats inside of water towers, this is where this time of my life was from. And uh, and so we'd put in about the same amount of hours, and and so we could work 14 hours a day, six days out of the week, because we were subject to DOT laws. Anybody uh, have their commercial driver's license or subject to various uh, maybe some of you pilots out there like there's only so many hours that you can work before the government says actually you can't i know you think you can but we've done some research and we've looked at history and anytime there's ever anybody sorts to start to break from the seven hour work week it doesn't go well anytime we just kind of work people down to the bone eventually there's revolt burnout it doesn't work and so i just i, I dig this if you so like uh so we were, since we were subject to, to DOT laws, we had to have every seven days, we had to have a 36 hour period where you're off the clock, weren't driving, weren't behind the wheel, not in the vehicle, just chill. And so on those days, I would often go and meet friends. It was awesome the way the Lord just like, I, I, I know people all over the country and it was always funny to me that on Sundays, it just seemed to, I'd line up and, and my buddies, the, my coworkers would be like, so who do you know in this town? I'm like, actually, one of my good friends lives like three minutes from the hotel. They're going to come pick me up and have dinner. You can come with. It's going to be great. And so I'd go and I'd attend a church service. And, and it was fun because in the times that I, like maybe I didn't know anybody, um, you know, I'd, I'd meet people and, and we'd hang out. And it was, it was, it was odd to me because during that time, I was, I was working just as much. And I was, I was further from, from home and didn't have as much community, but I started to, to rest and to slow down. And then I'd, I'd quit that job because uh, there was this really smoking hot blonde that I wanted to spend more time with. And so, uh, and she told me, she's like, I'm not dating some dude. Fran took all of her blonde and her curls. It's weird. But anyway, um, <clears throat> and she told me, she said, I'm not, I'm not going to date some dude that's working over the road. And I was like, well. I have a job interview this afternoon with a company here in town so that I can be right here all the time. And so I worked for a landscaping company. My boss told me, he said, we're going to, he said, you're going to mark out seven to seven, Monday through Friday, seven to seven, Monday through Friday. That's mine. What you do outside of that, whatever, but that's mine. And so again, I was back to putting in huge hours, working labor, long hours, whatever. And, uh, but man, I, 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 and then, you know, Saturdays we'd go and we'd play and whatever else. And then, and one of the things I remember, I, I, I would do the kind of the same thing where I'd try to run really hard and go all over the place and go visit friends and whatever else, hop on a motorcycle, take off. And, and as Megan and I were spending more and more time together, uh, she was really good about saying like, hey, instead of getting back at 1030 at night so that we can go to work the next day, what if we got back for dinner and we could just relax a little bit? And maybe, you know, get things ready for the week. I was like, oh, novel concept. Sure, let's do that. And so despite the fact that I was regularly working more hours in a week than I was at the ranch, the sense of hurry and, and, and the restlessness dissipated, the sense of calm permeated. 
despite the fact that we were working long hours, tons of labor. I mean, it was great. You could eat as much as you wanted to, and like you just could not get enough calories in. And despite all that, it's still one of the most restful times that I can think of. Why? Because I was learning to rest. I was learning to slow down. I was learning the unhurried rhythms of abiding with Christ. So when we think about uh, what does it look like for us as disciples and some of these practices that we can put into place that would help us to, to participate with, with Jesus and what he's doing and as we can continue to look at how we go with the Holy Spirit, with God's holy people, for the kingdom of God. And I just want to just take a moment to just look at uh, Acts 13. So we see Paul and Barnabas, they're traveling around. Uh, so Paul, is, is, uh, he's, he's been converted, he becomes a Christian, and, and you would think that, you know, he's, I mean, he's, got, he's a really important guy, right? He's got to go all over the place, he should be running and gunning and meeting all the people and doing all the things and whatever else, and yet we find Paul and Barnabas, and Barnabas was a pretty connected business guy. Uh, Barnabas was the guy who, who just kind of knew everybody around, and so he was kind of Paul's, uh, you know, connection to these different cities. And so you'd think that, you know, I mean, of anybody to have the excuse, right? Because they know, I mean, Paul already wrote in Galatians by this time. He's like, hey, you're not under the law anymore. So you'd think that Paul would be like, we're not going to, we're not going to do Sabbath. We're going to just continue to go and we're going to meet everybody. And we're going to, we're going to continue because we got lots to do. And yet Paul and Barnabas go and they participate in the Sabbath. And, and they go and they, they listen to the word of God. <clears throat> Which, I mean, I just did because, I mean, Paul, like, Historically, we would have known that, like, in order to be who Paul was, would have had what we call the Hebrew, what, what we call the Old Testament, would have had that memorized. Like, you'd start reading a sentence, stop halfway through the sentence, and Paul would just be able to continue on. Pretty, pretty awesome, huh? Right? And yet, he's like, oh, you know, you know what's really important? Is I, I just got to be there. I got to be where, the, where, the, where my friends are, where, where my people are, and I, and I got to listen to the word of God. Has it memorized? Still listening to people reading it. Okay? And and this weather, so it's just like permeated within him. And and so it's like, well, why? And so it kind of it, it gets us to, to thinking, like, why would he do this? And I would offer the question, why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't you take a time, a 24-hour period in Paul's case, to stop, to listen? to participate in, in the rhythms of, of grace with those around you, to have the words read to you. And now, in order to, uh, Sabbath, is that like something that everyone grew up just participating in or, you know, no, not really. Why, and, and, and maybe the question is like, why, why do we do Sabbath at all? And, and maybe you have different ideas of what Sabbath looks like. I know for me, largely Sabbath was, was formed by Little House on the Prairie. I think I've talked about this, where it was always like cold breakfast and just this really weird thing. And I never really understood it as a child. I was like, oh yeah, that, that, that Sabbath, that doesn't sound awesome at all. Uh, I don't know why you'd eat like, if you're like, oh yeah, like, church is a great time. Go listen to a long sermon after eating cold leftover breakfast that you left in the oven overnight that was probably dry. It's like, this is a gift? This is grace? I don't get it. <clears throat> Let's look at historically what this would have meant to the Jews. So, um, <clears throat> when is the Bible commanded to be written? Does anybody know? When, when do we first see the Bible, the command to write down the words of Scripture? Okay, it's in Exodus 17. And so in Exodus 17, what's happening is, is the, uh, the Israelites have, have been set free. They're going out into the wilderness, and, and they, they win this battle. And, and the Lord says uh, to Moses, hey, write down these words. These are the things that I want you to remember. <clears throat> write this in a memorial as a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek, so the person who is attacking them from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of of it, the Lord is my banner, saying, a hand upon the throne of the Lord, and the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So it's this, this idea of victory, okay? And so he's like, I want you to remember that, that you and the battle, this is the one, if, if you're familiar, it's the story where, where every time like Moses' hands are up, 
the, the Israelites win, and every time Moses' hands are down, the Israelites are getting defeated. And so, uh, you know, if, if you do this for a long period of time, after a while you won't be able to hold your hands up, and so they put rocks underneath them. Okay, so the, it's just a big example. It's, it's not Moses' strength that's, been, that's winning the battle. It isn't the people's strength, rather, but the Lord's provision. Now, why is that interesting? And why is it that the first thing that they write down is, is Genesis 1 and 2? And what's, what's significant about that? Now, um, I want you to imagine for a moment that, uh, that you have been enslaved for 400 years. Okay? Uh, your only worth uh, comes from how much you produce. I know that none of us could imagine a society that would believe that your worth comes from what you produce. I know that that's nothing that we experience here in America. I know that's nothing that has been you know, just shoved down our throats uh, in, in the West at all. Um, but just imagine for a moment that your worth and your significance comes from what you produce, okay? Now, not only that, if you didn't produce, they would start taking things away from you. And I'm not t talking about your toys. I'm talking about things like your kids and your life. Now, what does that start to do to your brain? Okay. Uh, pop psychology, we call this scarcity mindset. We call this trauma. And we see that generationally, this actually starts to do things to our genetic coding. Okay? Now, for 400 years, an entire ethnic group ha has believed that their worth comes from what they do. And they're scared to not do, because if they don't do, then bad things are going to happen to them. Okay? And so, to this people, the Lord gives Genesis 1 and 2. Okay? And so if we contrast the Genesis 1 and 2 narrative to what the Egyptians were believing about creation, which was the Epic of Gilgamesh, which at the very center is the, the gods meddling with humanity and, and them just kind of screwing around, and then, and then you know, somebody trying to outsmart the gods in order to uh, you know, win back and, and bring justice and, and prevail in humanity. Okay? So we have that. If that's your view of who God is, so imagine you're, 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 you're tra you, you live from a sense of trauma. You live in, 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 from a sense of scarcity. Okay? And not just you, but everybody that you know. Everybody that you know. There's no rich uncle that you might be able to track down someday. There's no benevolence that might happen at some point in time. There is no hope. There's nobody that you know that's, that's in any different or better spot than you are. You're all at ground zero. And then who you believe God is is someone who just menaces with society. Is there a reason the people are grumbling when they're walking out in the middle of the wilderness, right? Because they're like, at least we, like, we would have had food. And, and, and to this people, Yahweh says, hey, write this down. In the beginning, I created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, in the beginning, in the beginning, in the beginning. And he continues to talk to them more and more about who he is and what he's done. Interestingly enough, uh, he doesn't, all the references, he, he, the, if you want to get just super nerdy for a second, um, the, the numbers and the letters that are used for the Sumerian god of creation, it's only those letters that aren't used in Genesis. Use all the other ones, that God is completely devoid of the Genesis 1 and 2 narrative. There's no reference to so saying, I can do all of this without you. To say, I've, I've done all of this independent of this God that you think that you might believe in. No, it's, it's me. And so, and in the middle of, of this is this invitation to rest. We've talked about chiastic structure before. I'm, I'm only going to do one nerdy thing today. Uh, but in the middle of... <clears throat> Uh, of Genesis 1 and 2, we have this invitation to rest. Now, there's a command to work, right? It says, six days you'll work, um, or actually, we'll get that later, but it says, we see the Lord, you know, he works six days, and then on the seventh day, uh, he takes the day off. And, and so we see that work is something that we're, is good. Like, I know that so many of us, we, uh, you may be a little more Blink-182 about how, about your, your opinion of work, um, and that you don't like it a lot. That's the the, uh, the radio version to, the way to say that. Um, but work is, is a gift that's given to us. Like it's a command. We're, we're to go out, we're to do this, we're to participate in it. 
but the promise has been fractured by sin. Our, our ability to, to actually see work as a gift has been broken by sin. And we see the Sabbath is a gift. Genesis 11, uh, the building of, of Babel, right? So we have uh, what people thought was, well, we need to get closer to the heavens, like the stuff down here on the earth. We gotta, we're going to build up. We're going to get into the thin spaces. And so we're going to build these cathedrals. And as we talked about last week, this is where God kind of looks down and goes, aw, cue it. Look at that. And then confuses their language. Why? Because Yahweh doesn't want holy places. He wants holy people. He doesn't want holy places. He wants holy people. So I'm glad that we get to come here. I'm glad we get to hang out here. I'm glad that 824 Laurel Street is the place that we've agreed to just come at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning and chill out. But the point isn't that this becomes like this place where we go that's, and that, that, that's like super sacred, right? It's that we become people that go out of here bringing the good news of the gospel to the world around us, that we are a holy people that go out so that every time that somebody who meets us, they meet and they can have an encounter with God. Not a holy place, but holy people. And so this is what I dig is that then that, that Sabbath, this idea of taking a day off, is commanded to a nomadic people. So now imagine, again, Imagine that you're, you're 400 years, trauma, whatever else, and then the Lord brings you out, and, and nobody you know, nobody you know is out there with you. You're, you're around like in, in foreign places. You ever like been lost in a city that you didn't know about, like especially for those of us that remember navigating like before Google Maps and like pre-TomTom? -tom. If you don't know who TomTom -tom is, it's fine. It wasn't that great anyway, uh, right? But like, you ever been like lost? And you're like, man, like, what am I going to do? Or like anybody remember like back then you'd, you'd like break down and there wasn't stuff like, you know, you'd like you hope there was a mechanic close by, right? Now imagine there's 6 million of you. Resources are probably a little scarce. Why? Because you're in the desert. Like, it's not like you're just walking through Northern Minnesota in the fall and you're just like plucking stuff off the trees. You're in the desert. And it's to those people that Yahweh says, oh yeah, and by the way, uh, one day out of the six, you're going to walk along, and then on that, that you're just going to pause. And you're not going to gather any food. How many of us, we hear that, we go, excuse me, what? Um, I don't know if you remember, uh, we're, we're a nomadic people. It's like, we're not agrarian. We're more on that hunter-gatherer kind of thing, real heavy on the gather. You've been dropping that stuff down. It'd be great if we could keep gathering and keep going because, uh, you know, Egypt is behind us. This promised land that you told us about is before us. We'd really kind of like to get there. We're stuck in limbo. Uh, we, we as people don't do well with the in-between, right? They're good, like, incites our, our, our sense of restlessness, okay? Imagine six million people for 40 years. Do you think they're getting a little bit restless? And it's to those people that Yahweh says, I'm going to give you a gift. You're going to pause. You're going to stop. You're going to cease. As they get into the promised land, they start to develop this habit and these rhythms. And, and one of the things I, just a few things I want to share about with, with Sabbath, one of the things I, I just totally love is it, it begins at sundown. So, it begin, and I think that it's like it's the first three stars are seen in the sky, right? So if you live in Minnesota, right, like wintertime, you're like four o'clock, shutting her down, <laughs> calling it good. Summertime, buckle up. But anyway, uh, but isn't it great? Like, so we begin the day with a shared meal done slowly to a liturgy with people that we enjoy being around so that we would remember the Lord. And then the first item on the day, one is eating. Okay, cool. Second item on the list is going to sleep. I love doing things. If you spend time around me, you know that like I need to get better at sleep. I'm afraid to get a whoop because I know what it's going to tell me. I don't need a whoop to tell me that I just need to sleep more. But 
the gift is this, hey, the first item of business is rest, is sleep. And and uh, there were and then as 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 you may maybe you experience and, and one of the things I like about our, our potlucks is like right is, is you come and, and there's all kinds of food and we all get to share and hang out, um, but we understand and as we'll see throughout the scriptures right there there can be this this tension where we're like well what happens if uh, you know like somebody has more somebody has less and how how do we do this there are actually a special offerings that were taken throughout the year that were then put aside so that at these sabbath meals so once a week you, you get to you hang out and then they have this like this big once a year big blowout thing and like during the feast of tabernacles they just like have a huge party but big party and it wasn't just like what we i mean i i like that we get the patties from costco that have the extra fat in them if you're not into 80 20 chuck uh sorry um it's great i love it i love brats but like the sabbath meal was like oh yeah we're not just doing it's not just like chicken it's like oh no we're, we're getting the good cuts and and the people that have more they they've been putting more aside and the people that don't have as much it's at least once a year you get to have the fillet at least once a year you get to have your your sense of dignity and honor upheld because everyone in the community sat at the same table and they ate the same meal and it was delicious and it was good. They didn't just gather everyone together and give them some kind of grade D government garbage full of all kinds of filler and whatever else. But it was like, oh no, this is the good stuff. And we're going to sit together and we're going to enjoy it. And it was a gift. And so what do we glean from this? And how do we, how do we start to think about this as disciples of Jesus? As, 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 I think we start to think about it as the Sabbath is a gift that we're invited to participate. When we think about the gospel, right? Like you can't all right, we look at verse 38 of, of, uh, of the text here in, in 13. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that though this man, uh, through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything. For sin, our sense of desperation, our anxiety about whether or not we're going to get it done, we've been set free. And so, uh, I know that uh, depending on what kind of theological background you have or training or whatever else, there's all kinds of different ways about how we can think about the Sabbath. And there's some people, well, we don't need to celebrate it. We do need to celebrate it, this, that, whatever else. And at the end of it, I would just say, well, why wouldn't you? Jesus has secured our rest, which is knowledge of salvation. I just think it, it just is our advantage to cease and to pause and, some, and to take some time to do that. At least three reasons uh, as we participate in these life-giving rhythms, um, and you, we, you've heard me. Uh, if you've if you've been here for a while, you maybe hear me ending the sermons each week and remember, remind, rejoice. Uh, those aren't original to me. I uh, just pulled those out of the Old Testament. They're just verbs that I see over and over and over. Remember, remind, rejoice. Remember the story of God. Remember, Paul's been doing this again. He's got the Old Testament memorized, but he's still going to the Sabbath and he's remembering what's going on. And then at the end of this, hey, hey, do you, have, do you have some words to encourage us? Remind us, right? And Paul gets up and he just goes through and he gives them an, an Old Testament survey. And then he goes, and all of that is because Jesus came and he's freed you from everything. And, and he says, hey, look, here, here's the warning. Hey, look, don't end up being you know, the people that the, the prophets prophesied against, right? The, they don't want to be the scoffer. Um, but as they went out, they told him the next day, and, and, but they tell him this good news, and, and even I have a light for the Gentiles. And so now all of a sudden, there's these people that are coming back, and they're participating because God's story is an encouragement to us. And so why wouldn't we take some time to listen to the story of God that would be, we would be encouraged? And then finally, rejoice. You, I mean, they're the next week, people are, are coming back. I mean, imagine uh, a weekly gathering that you couldn't wait to get back to. I'm glad that for so many of us, we have a few of those. Some of it is, is this time. Some of us, it is our communitas groups. We just can't wait to get there. We can't wait to be around these people because not just is the food good, especially if you're hanging out with Matt, um, but also because the people are good. It's not just a sacred meal. It's not just a sacred place, but it's a holy people. And we're around them, and we want more. And so they continue to invite their friends. And then these people are rejoicing. This, listen to verse 48 again. And when the Gentiles heard this, when the non-believers heard this, when the people outside the crowd, when the people who wouldn't have been invited in, when they heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. 
and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Imagine what it would be like to just rest and see your non-believing neighbors come to Jesus. So, why, what happens if we don't do this? What happens if we don't get on board with this notion? One more story. Um, I was listening to a, a, a woman who, she'd written a book on Sabbath, she's an atheist, um, and it's been kind of interesting to track her. She's spoken at a number of different things, and the longer she's participated in Sabbath, she started to participate in Sabbath, and the longer she participated in it, uh, the more she started to question her, her, her disbelief in God and started to question why she might consider the ways of the Lord. And it was interesting to watch the ways that her views have changed, and, and she was being interviewed by somebody who was like, well, you're not an atheist anymore. Now you're an agnostic. Like you've, it, you've moved from like, don't believe that, that God exists at all to there is a God, and, and I'm just not really sure how it's working. And, and, and so there, there's this movement within her just through participating and, and, and ceasing. And, uh, and the pastor who was interviewing uh, shared a little bit of his story. Um, and when he was in college, he started to practice Sabbath. And uh, <clears throat> he, would, he would not study on Sunday nights. And a lot of his exams were on Monday morning. And so he's like, well, Saturday night, I'm going to go out with my friends. And so by Saturday afternoon, I just need to be done. And so he'd ordered his life around taking some time off. And so, and, and as a result, his heart started to get ordered around the ways of the Lord. And, uh, and he said he noticed, what, what, he, what he found interesting was that his first semester where he was just studying, going crazy, and doing all these things, uh, he, he pulled like a B average, right? Like, not bad, not bad. Um, but then the next, uh, for the rest of his time, uh, in college, he would practice this this day off. He'd go to church. He'd spend time with friends. He'd eat a meal. He'd go to bed. Whatever else, he was rested. Um, and he actually he was pulling A's the whole way through. Um, and and it wasn't like he was going to a slouch school, right? I mean, he was at Yale. You know, just like goes from B's to A's. Nothing different. Just taking a day off. Am I starting to? get us to think that maybe taking a day off to focus on the Lord is a halfway decent idea? Okay, what does this look like, though? How many of us are going, yeah, this, that sounds great, but like, what does it actually look like? And for many of us, like, we look at our, at our week and we go, where am I going to put 24 hours together where I can actually get this done, where I can actually do this? And, and what would it look like? I can remember the first time sitting with somebody who we were going to do a silence, uh, silent retreat, and they're like, oh, we're going to be silent for four hours. My buddy comes to me, and he's got the Bluetooth in with the blinking light. You know, like, I mean, just a constant barrage of phone call and whatever else coming in. He's like, this is going to be tough for me. I don't do really well with silence. I'm super nervous. And I was like, it's going to be okay, Arthur. We're going to be okay. And at the end of it, he was like, that was really hard. And that I just don't, but that was really good. And I can't wait to do it again. And I'm also scared. But he's growing. He's shifting. He's changing. And so uh, just a few things to think about, right? So these, uh, these, this, uh, these disciplines, these things that we're going to go over over the next couple of weeks, they're learned, which means they're taught to us by the Holy Spirit. And they're developed over time with the Holy Spirit, with the holy people. We don't do these in isolation. We don't do these in a vacuum. We don't do these in a box. We do these with one another. So uh, if, you want to, if you're a note taker or if you're a, a, somebody who's into, um, what's that when stuff all starts with the same letter? Uh, whatever that is, that mnemonic. What is it? Alliteration. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, if you're into alliteration, today's your day. Four R's. Release, rest, renew, rejoice. Release, rest, renew, rejoice. If you can't do this in 24, then you can find a half a day, or you can find a four-hour period, or you can find a chunk. I'm a believer that if you if you do, if you just start this, like you're you're gonna you're going to enjoy it, and you're gonna want more. Like I think that if you're on a steady diet of of McDonald's cheeseburgers, and I bring you a dry-aged ribeye, I don't need to like pull the McDonald's away from you. I think that you'll just come back and want the ribeye, okay? So, and I, I think much is, is, is very similar with Sabbath. 
and, and this idea. So release. The work is done for now. There's so many times when I, I've pushed through to try to get to a deadline or, or finish a project. I'm like, no, I got to get the work done. And there's times for that, right? Like I remember when I was landscaping one summer, I, I bought, we were coming up to that seven o'clock margin and we had, we were all covered in dirt. We've been laying sod all day. And he's like, look, we can, we can be done at seven. It's like, we can be done at seven if you want to. I, I told you, I'd never ask you, you know, to work after seven or I, I would never make you, but I'm going to ask you. And if you want to leave, you got a place to go, it's fine, whatever else. He goes, but, you know, we can just stay until it's done. And we're all like, we're here. The stuff's unloaded. We're rocking and rolling. We are literally covered from head to toe in, in dirt. Let's just make it happen. We powered through till 8.30. His wife brought us Dairy Queen, and we all jumped in the lake and all of our clothes the next day. It was awesome. Okay. But there's a... a how many of us, though, when we look at it, we go, oh, I got to get this done. I got to get it, got to get it, got to get it, got to get it. When really, we just got to be done. We just got to go, it's, it's good enough for now. And it'll be there when I come back to it. And so we release. And we say, Lord, we trust in you and in your provision and that I'll be able to get this done. I'll be able to come back to this. It will be here for me. And then we rest. Um, on Thursdays, so the way looks like, this looks for me, uh, because today is kind of a work day for me, um, I, not kind of, it is, um, on, we do Friday Sabbath, and so on Thursday night, uh, I lock my office door, and I close it. Sometimes I do that throughout the week, most of the time I don't, most of the time it's open. Fun fact, there's nothing in there to steal but theology books, I have a left. Um, and office supplies. If you need them, let me know. Um. And so I, I close the door. And it's just a, a little reminder to me that the work is done for the week. I also lock it so that none of your kids can go in there and hide. It's just one less place they can hide back there in the maze. <laughs> um, and then sleep. Turn off, so I, you know, maybe just turn off devices. Um, I usually joke that like you either have to be dead or dying, dead or related to me to talk to me on, on a Friday. Uh, some of you try to get a hold of me on a Friday. It's not necessarily very easy. My phone usually stays in a drawer. It's on airplane mode a lot of the day. Um, I'm not checking it. I set it to personal. There's this thing. There's this. It's built into your phone. If you just swipe upward, oh, there we go. Maybe there's these different preferences. So I can set it to like now. If one of you, unless you're Megan, you can't get through. That's fun. Personal. She's the only one. It just sits on that all day. Uh, do I do funerals on Friday? Sure, sometimes. But like we schedule time elsewhere, right? Because it isn't, again, it's a gift. It isn't a, it isn't a command. Um, and then renewal. Uh, recreation versus recreation. Non-adrenal, focus on the presence of the Lord. We live, gosh, is it not awesome to live where we live? Like most of us have, like we're here because we like to be here and we haven't moved away because we want to stay here right? Why? Golfing, mountain biking, fishing, road riding, hunting, good friends, like, you know, just proximity. Like, it's, it's a great place to be, right? It's, you can be active, you can chill, you can relax, whatever. It's a lot of fun. However, there's a lot of us, though, that, that replace recreation of sabbath with recreation we go i got a day off we're going to do what i did when i was in my mid-20s and we're just going to burn it at both ends and it's just really really difficult to have quiet times of abiding with the lord where he can actually speak to you when you're redlining when your brain is producing adrenaline it's really tough to just and listen to the lord Like I just, if you're having a near-death experience or your body thinks that you are, you just can't listen, right? That's why the Lord brings them out and trains them to pause, cease, listen. I think that's going to be the toughest thing for us here because we're so stimulated. We have, you know, it's, it's like, oh, how can I take advantage of this? I mean, even myself, right? Like how many, how many of you this afternoon are going to go out and you're going to try to double dip? You're going to try to do some yard work and listen to a podcast. 
or you're gonna like read a book. This is what I, I, go, what I talked to you about. Like I go to the gym and I'll read a book while I'm sitting on a spin bike. And I try to get two things done at once. If I can get three, even better. And the Lord says, no, you're just not gonna do that today. You're just gonna stop. I'm gonna pause. Because this is about recreation, not recreation. Same letters, different emphasis. When we think about recreation, it's focus on the Father. And then rejoice. Okay, so you know, so you've rested, you've slept in. The next day, you're going to renew. Uh, fun, fun fact. So the the Jews usually ate two meals a day, except for on the Sabbath, they got a third. Fun, okay. So uh, not not cheat day, right? Because cheat day, like that's there's like some law, there's guilt, there's whatever else. And all this is just like enjoyment day. This is feast day. So like, eat the dark chocolate. If you're me, have the fillet. Grill the good food, hang out with the friends, get the super premium ice cream, do the whole deal. Go big, have a blast. We'll talk about fasting and feasting later on, but just for now in the Sabbath, enjoy it. Have more burger, go for it. And then rejoice. It's just this interesting thing that happens when, when, you, when you've rested, when you've slept, when you've eaten enough, when you've spent time with people who, who you enjoy spending time with and, and you're learning and you're cultivating relationships. It's difficult to not rejoice. It's difficult to not go to sleep with, with your heart full and your mind at rest. So a few things to consider. Do you have a time set aside each week for resting and worshiping God? Again, all in grace, no shame here. If you're feeling a sense of shame, that's, that's not what we're after. Okay, this is all in light, in, in, in light of God's grace. Do you have a time set a week for resting and worshiping God? And if you don't, how does that idea strike you? And then how might the Spirit be shaping your ideas of rest and Sabbath? As we said, this is done in community, right? And this is done over time. And it, like for me, for a long period of time, it was like it was just Megan and I hanging out. And then finally, we're like, we should probably have somebody over for dinner. And and so we, we started to build that in. And 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 or there's days when uh, it kind of depends on on what's different, right? Like, is uh, my social bandwidth is considerably higher than most? Um, and so Megan and I alternate. So one, of a, uh, one week I get to invite people over that we enjoy kind of just chilling and being around and that aren't going to, you know, it's just, we're just going to be present. And then the next week we watch a movie and she picks the movie because that's what rejuvenates her and that's what brings rest. And, and now we're getting to bring Fran in and like, hey, Fran, what do you want to do? And so sometimes we have a bunch of six and seven-year-old girls around, which is restful in its own <laughs> different way. Sometimes, sometimes we watch the parent trap. Um, and so with whom and, and would you Sabbath and how might this impact your relationship with one another? What does it look like to just spend time with people chilling out? Focusing on the Lord. Not having conversations about what's going on in, in you know, the news. But having conversations about good news. And then what picture comes to mind of how a practice of Sabbath would begin to shape our church? What, what would it look like if, if we as a people were regularly engaging in rhythms with one another where we ceased to strive, where we were focused on Christ, where we were released from our work, where we had a, just a pervasive sense of, of rest and renewal, how might we rejoice? And what does that then begin to do with the non-believers around us? See, even when I mean, you talk to people and they go like, hey, I remember like talking with folks like, hey, what are you doing on Friday? I'm like, oh, we're, we're chilling. I'm like, oh, do you want to go like go to this thing? I'm like, no, I, that sounds fun. That's, that sounds like a really good thing to do on Saturday or any other day of the week. But Friday, no, I just got to, I just got to hang. I'm like, why? why? I'm like, because I it, it just, just need to. I have to rest. And it's this idea to our go, go, go society that we just don't really understand it. But over time, I think we went out. In fact, I know we do. So what does it look like when we start to do that? So when we remember, we remind, we rejoice. 
Let's remember that the Sabbath is a gift. Let's remind one another that our worth and our, and our meaning and our merit comes from Christ and his work, not from what we do. And let's rejoice in the fact that the Holy Spirit is with us and he's surrounded us with the holy people that we get to go out and exhibit and show the kingdom of God to a world who is so desperately looking for rest. So as we do each week, uh, we're going to take some time in silence and in response. Uh, there's some food prep containers underneath the, the rows. Go ahead and pass those down. There's some sticky notes in there. And I just want you to write a, a short response to today, uh, something that the Lord is, is doing in through you. It could be a question that you have. It could be a statement, um, anything. And then if you're willing uh, to sign your name, that would be great. If not, uh, it's fine too. And then just place it over here on the redeemed wall. And um, after a little bit of time, Kara and the rest of the musicians will come back up and away we'll go. So let me pray for us as those containers are passed out. Lord, we thank you for the gift of rest. We thank you that in the midst of, of the zaniness of the summer and, and all that is going on, that you give us a moment to pause and to cease, to abide in you, to learn the rhythm of your ways, to be focused. So, Lord, with all of our being, we worship you. And with all of our being, we rest. We thank you that you continue to create us new every morning.